Hey guys, real quick, if you need a recap of Outer Banks seasons one through three, just hit the tab in the upper right hand corner. It'll take you right to it. Now, season three did end with the Pogues being heroes. Welcome back. They had the gold and they all had various things they did with it. But there was a lot in between from them returning from El Dorado to them becoming heroes. Initially, when they returned, they linked back up with their families, and some of their families welcomed them back with open arms, like popes, and then others, well, they didn't, like keys. Then there was Sarah's family. She blamed Sarah for the death of Ward. She's basically been ostracized. She can't even talk to Wheezy. But what Sarah did have was her Pogue family, and they had a whole lot of gold. And once they tallied up their amount, they had a little over $1.1 million. Now, Pope was the responsible one. He realized that if they divvy this up between them, they're going to all blow it. So what he proposed is they pool the money together and they build something sustainable. JJ's family's home and the land is in foreclosure. So buy up the land, build up a dock, build up the home. They can all live there. They can work there. And they can have like a bait and tackle and a charter boat situation. That way, they actually have something that they can build upon, something that's theirs and something that will bring in money. And it takes a little bit of convincing, but they all get aboard with this idea. They're going to basically build Poglandia too, their own space. The issue is getting the land, because it was in foreclosure. Pope explains to the group they're going to need every single dollar they have, which means not overspending. His strategy going into the bidding is going to be simple. He's only going to bid up by one dollar and not a dollar more. And he tells everybody, get on board with this plan because we need to save cash. Initially, the bidding starts out at $80,000. Pope bids it up to 80001 But then the bids start going up a little bit. JJ can't help himself. He just comes out the gate and bids $100,000, which wasn't a part of Pope's plan. To JJ, he thinks it's going to be a knockout punch for the other bidders, but it's not. Another guy steps forward and offers 150, and next thing you know, you've got a bidding war that Pope can't get a handle on. At the end of it, they do end up getting JJ's property for $775,000, 30% over market value. They got hosed. But they did get the property. They then get to work building the place up, and they do a great job. They build a deck, they redo the home. They have a proper business, and they even get their first customer who is in love with their new spot because they have such good bait. For the Pogues, things were going great. Sarah and John B. were banging like jackrabbits. Pope was going back to school. Key was growing stuff in her garden. Life was truly good. Until one day, they got the shadiest customer that stepped onto their dock. Right away, the guy just starts giving the dirtiest look to Key and Sarah. He randomly decides to open up one of the knives, but then he starts questioning about fishing and a certain dangerous location. And then he acts like he just so happened to recognize him, as if he didn't step foot on that dock knowing exactly who was there. He says, oh, hey, you guys are the treasure hunter kids, right? And they explain, not anymore. But that's when he just leaves. And everybody that witnessed it is very confused on who this shady character was but they kind of put it out of mind. That's because the next morning they have a bigger issue. There was a storm throughout the night and it busted their fuse box, which killed the power to the dock. With no power means no freezers and no refrigerators, which means all the bait died, and that's a lot of their business. They barely have enough money to stay afloat right now. Now, they do have a reserve nugget, but Pope is saving that nugget for property taxes, and he tells the group, we're not touching it. What we need to do is scale back. We need to stop spending as much. We really should have been spending better to begin with, but we weren't. Now we're in a pickle. So we need to build back up our wealth a little bit, do this properly, and just take the lifestyle hit for a little bit. And no one's happy with that, but they don't really have a choice. At least they don't think they have a choice. JJ, always a genius with ideas, comes up with a great plan. There's a dirt bike race on the beach that's held every year. JJ, in his infinite wisdom, decides to bet the golden nugget on himself at 7 to 1 odds. Because, as he tells John B., I can't lose. Well, at least not without John B.'s help. He coerces John B. into entering the race so John B. can block Topper 
and Rafe, who will clearly be out to get them because Topper and Rafe aren't big fans of the Pogues after, well, they think that they had something to do with Ward's death. And it's not like John B. wanted to enter this race, but he feels like he doesn't have a choice with the Golden Nugget on the line. So he does. And it does not start off well for JJ. His bike stalls. He's in dead last. Then he gets pushed off his bike by Topper. Things are looking very, very bleak for JJ until he pulls some evil Knievel crap and he ends up in first in a dead heat with Rafe to the finish line. And right before they reach it and JJ wins, Rafe taps his back wheel. They both go flying and it's Topper who ends up on top. JJ and the Pogues have lost the money they needed for the property taxes. As you can imagine, this does not sit well with Pope, the responsible one. It doesn't really sit well with any of them. And to make matters worse, J.J. isn't taking any responsibility. He still thinks his idea was sound. He actually blames John B. for not being better at blocking. There's a lot of infighting and not a lot of solutions. And finally, Pope yells, Look, we have a $13,000 property tax due in seven days, and we don't have any cash. And with no solutions, he just storms off. But that's when their luck seemed to turn. Because later that day, the Outer Bank Sentinel posted an article on their website about the Pogues discovering El Dorado. It was confirmed. Archaeologists went into the cave that was blown up and they found it and they gave the Pogues credit. That changed everything. Because the Pogues were recognized as heroes. They were celebrated at a ceremony with their friends and, well, they didn't really have friends at this point, but their family was there. And that's where they were approached by an old guy named Wes Jenneret. He's the guy that brought them Blackbeard's captain log. Jenneret invited them to his private estate to discuss the proposition further. And his estate is a little shady. There's a lot of lore around it. It's kind of spooky. And even though the Pogues don't want to go there, they also don't have a choice because they're broke. So they head there. The property is called Blackstone. And as soon as the Pogues touch down on it, they're pretty freaked out. It doesn't help that one of the property servants, a guy named Demp, is um, uh, cold, we'll say. Not friendly, a little unwelcoming. They knock on the door anyway, and a guy named Chandler Groff opens up. He's Wes's son-in-law. There's just something about this guy that doesn't seem quite right, and some of the Pogues are a little worried. They kind of want to leave. But when he invites him in the house to discuss the issue further, one by one, they all step in. Because they all know that they need the money. In episode 2, Chandler escorts all the Pogues into a room with Wes. And Wes explains his mission further. He didn't want to do so publicly because it's a little out there. You see, his property has been haunted by Blackbeard's bride's ghost. It sounds crazy, but his ancestor was the one who caught Blackbeard and killed him. He also killed his wife, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth has haunted the family for 300 years. Since then, Jenneret's have taken their own life, including Wes's daughter and Chandler's wife. She had a visitation from Elizabeth about a week before she died, and Elizabeth wanted her to go get an amulet, a necklace. She didn't do it, and she died. And Wes thinks that if they were to find the amulet, they would break the curse. And the reason why he really wants to get this done is because he recently had a visitation from Elizabeth, so he knows that time is running up for him as well. Here's where the issue comes in. The amulet is in Blackbeard's ship, which was lost 300 years ago. Luckily, they do know where the ship is, or at least the vicinity of the ship, but Pope points out the Coast Guard went over that site years ago. West says, well, they didn't know what we know. He pulls out the captain's log and shows that there was a secret lockbox hidden behind the headboard in the captain's chamber. He feels like that's where the amulet would be. He's willing to pay the Pogues $50,000 to return the amulet, $5,000 up front. It's not going to be easy. They'd have to locate the ship, dive down, get the amulet, return it. But with their current financial situation, it's a pretty good offer. And the only one that really wants to take it right away is J.J., but the others want to have a conversation about it. They're a little concerned about taking this offer because it seems like Wes Jenneret is absolutely insane. I mean, he's talking about his family being haunted and ghosts. But eventually, they all realize, yeah, $5,000 up front, that takes care of the property tax. All right, we'll entertain it. We'll try to find the amulet. 
and will try to break this guy's quote-unquote family curse. They head back to Poglandia and start devising a plan. Since the Coast Guard excavated that site, they feel like the Coast Guard absolutely knows where the ship is. But getting that information from the Coast Guard is the problem. The Coast Guard isn't going to just give them that information. They're going to have to find a way to get it from the Coast Guard. There's two options. JJ knows a guy that works for the Coast Guard, but they'd have to pay him. And then there's Pope's uncle, who also works for the Coast Guard. And he would absolutely know where the ship is. But the issue is, Pope's uncle is very, very straight-laced. He knows that his uncle isn't going to give that information up. He's too by the book. But they convince him to at least ask because it doesn't hurt. And when Pope does, his uncle is ashamed, appalled, embarrassed, disappointed, like every negative you can think of. That causes them to revert to JJ's buddy. As JJ and John B. head off to go meet up with JJ's friend, Cleo and Sarah are running the shop when they get an interesting visitor. It's the guy from the auction, the guy that was bidding them up. He's come with a piece of paper, and it seems like it's an offer for the property, and he explains that they're going to lose this property eventually, so they might as well sell now. And Sarah just kind of laughs it off, because Sarah knows that they're getting $5,000, they're going to be able to afford the property tax, she's not worried about it, and she tells the guy to kick rocks. But then she actually looks at the piece of paper after he's left, and that's when she gets concerned. Because the piece of paper states that they're rezoning the area. It's an old tactic that her dad used to use all the time to force people to sell properties. You rezone the area, it changes the taxes to a point where they can't afford it, and they're forced to sell. And if this rezoning goes through, $5,000 isn't going to even be close to enough. So they're definitely concerned. A little while later, JJ and John B. return, and they do have the information they needed. It took a lot of convincing and some negotiations. JJ had to give up his prized dirt bike. But in the end, they got the location of Blackbeard's ship. The window, though, to dive is going to be very small. They promise JJ's buddy that they'll only be there for about 45 minutes to an hour, and he tells them you have to do it at night because it's a restricted area, and the Coast Guard during the day is swarming all over that place. They'll easily be able to see you during the day, so you have to do it at night. So that night, they're going to head out, and JJ, along with Key, are going to dive down and hopefully find the amulet. But before they leave... Sarah decides to tell John B. about her little visitor earlier. She didn't want to tell everybody else and stress them out, but it is cause for concern. He consoles her, but he doesn't really know what to do, so he decides to just get ready for the dive. Cleo and Sarah are going to hang back while Pope, John B., Key, and JJ head out. Sarah and Cleo are going to keep watch from the land. John B. and Pope are going to keep watch from the location. And that way, if anyone's sneaking up on them, they'll be able to radio down to the divers and let them know, hey, we've got company. When it comes time to dive, JJ and Key head down and they start looking for it. And they easily find the ship. It was exactly where they said it would be. But when they head inside, they find something super interesting. Modern diving equipment. They are not alone. And as they're trying to make sense of it, they're attacked. As those two are fighting for their lives in Blackbeard's ship, Up top, the girls see that there is a boat headed their direction, and it is not the Coast Guard, so they radio to John B. and Pope to warn them. Luckily, it's really, really foggy out, so that boat never sees them, but it's a very stressful situation up top, and it would be even more stressful if they had any idea what was going on underneath them. JJ is able to stab this mystery man with a spear, and they're able to fight him off, but in doing so, they ran out of air, so they had to quickly get to the surface. They're picked up by John B. and Pope, but there's an issue. They're going through the bends. The bends is a situation that happens to divers if they surface too quickly. Air can get stuck in their body, lungs, heart, and it can kill them. So essentially what they have to do is surface very slowly, stopping at intervals. But JJ and Key didn't do that because they had this guy trying to chase them down and, well, they were running out of air. The good news is, though, JJ did end up getting the amulet. The bad news is, because they're going through the bends, they need to be rushed to the hospital before they literally die. They do arrive just in the nick of time, but they're going to be put in a hyperbaric chamber for the next 12 hours. When the rest of the Poes get back to Pokelandia, Pope tells the group that they're owed a lot more than 50k. They need to go talk to Generet. Now that they have the amulet, they think that's a pretty good idea, and they head to Generet's property, but they're surprised to see Officer Shoop. 
Shoop's actually thrilled to see the group because he knows that they were one of the last people to ever talk to Wes Jenneret before he died, which is a big surprise to the Pogues. And then there's Rafe. Over with Sarah's brother, he's kind of taken over his father's real estate business. And while he's kind of just hanging out at the country club, he gets approached by one of his father's former associates. Her name is Hollis, and she's a real estate developer. And she tells Rafe that she has a very interesting opportunity for him, and she's looking for interested partners. Rafe's new girlfriend, Sophia, overhears the conversation, and she's a little concerned, so she walks over, and Rafe introduces her as just his friend, which is a little bit of a red flag. Hollis is nice enough to Sophia. She leaves Rafe with her card. And then she walks off. But the same night that the Pogues were busy trying to get the amulet back, Rafe decided to go meet with Hollis and hear her offer. The development project was around Goat Island, which is owned by the Generettes, which is home to Blackstone. It's the largest piece of undeveloped waterfront property on the eastern seaboard. With a very flirtatious tone, Hollis tells Rafe that they're deciding to sell this property after all these years because Wes believes that it's haunted. She promises Rafe that if he were to invest, he would make a fortune. In episode three the next day, Rafe starts thinking about this offer from Hollis, and he's a little concerned, because no one he knows has heard anything about it, and he's starting to think it's a scam. As he's telling Sophia the details, she also feels like it's pretty fishy, and she encourages him to not do it, because quite frankly, she doesn't trust Hollis. Later in the day, when Sophia gets home, her intuition is kind of proven right. She's just chilling in her room when her dad approaches her and asks about Rafe. And Sophia says, yeah, he's, he's fine. But the real reason he wants to know how Rafe is is because he knows Hollis. And Hollis approached him to approach Sophia and encourage Sophia to push Rafe into the deal. And if Sophia were to do that, she would be paid pretty handsomely. Sophia's from the cut. She's a pogue. She's not rich. So that money could really come in handy, but Sophia turns the offer down. She's actually insulted that her dad would even bring it up. She's not about to go behind her boyfriend's back to force him into a deal that he's not comfortable with. That all changes, though, later in the night. She heads to the country club, and she's going to go hang out with Rafe, but she overhears Rafe talking to his friends, and he's really dismissive about a relationship between he and Sophia. He basically says that he's not dating her. He's just kind of hooking up with her, and he doesn't really care about her. And that hurts Sophia deeply. She changes her whole mind, and she agrees to meet with Hollis and hear her out. And Hollis's offer is $25,000 if she were to push Rafe into the deal. So that's what Sophia's going to do. Now, as for the Pogues, they're getting questioned by Deputy Shoop, and they're all sticking with the same story. They didn't kill him. He hired them to do a job, and that's really it. They don't know how he died. Because there's no real evidence against them, they all get let go, but they are a little freaked out. I mean, this guy a couple days ago was talking about a ghost killing people, and, well, he showed up dead, just like he predicted. On their way back out to the boat, they run into Chandler, and he's grieving, obviously, but he tells them that he will honor Wes's deal if they do find anything. And they don't bring up the fact that they did, in fact, find the amulet. They just tell him, yeah, okay, we'll let you know if we do find anything. They want to go back to Poglandia and regroup a little bit. They notice with the amulet that there's an inscription in it, but they can't read it because it's Arabic. John B. actually knows somebody who could help out with that. It's a guy that his dad used to play pool with, so he and Sarah head over there to find out what this inscription says. While they do that, Pope and Cleo are going to go pick up JJ and Key from the hospital, and things have certainly gotten interesting at the hospital. As Key and JJ are just lying in this hyperbaric chamber, they notice a familiar face. It's the guy that came to the shop and was asking about their treasure hunting excursion. He's come to the hospital because he's got a bloody arm in the same spot where JJ stabbed the mystery diver. Now it's clear who the mystery diver was. And it's obvious by the look on his face that he knows JJ and Key were down there. This freaks them out quite a bit. They want to get the hell out of that hyperbaric chamber even though it's not time. And the nurse is just not listening and can't pick up on the most basic hand signals, which causes JJ to literally break the damn thing to bust out. When the hyperbaric chamber breaks, alarms go off, and the hospital staff comes rushing to find out what's going on. JJ is causing a scene. So they don't really even pay attention to Key, which allows Key to go grab this mystery diver's file and find out exactly who this guy is. 
Oh, and the alarm going off also tipped off the mystery diver as to the fact that Key and J.J. were trying to escape, so he took a keen interest in what was going on. But J.J. is able to evade hospital security, which allows he and Key to link back up with Pope and Cleo and escape before anything happens. Now that they have the guy's file, they at least know where he's living, so they head there to pay him a visit, beat him to the punch, see if they can catch him off guard, something. But where he's put his address down at is a beachfront hotel. It's literally on the pier. All four of them kind of find this weird, but they're going to stake out and see if they find him. Pope and Cleo stay in the car on the beach, while Key and JJ head up to the pier and see if they get eyes on him. Key and JJ, though, are in their own little world because they're dating. They're supposed to be keeping eyes out, but they're not doing a very good job of it. Pope and Cleo, meanwhile, they notice the guy right away. And what they notice is he walks up to a woman and starts having a conversation with her. Pope knows he needs to find out exactly what they're talking about. So he climbs up one of the pillars and starts eavesdropping on them. Pope overhears the guy say that he knows the name of their boat is the Snapper. He knows that they have the piece. And once he gets the piece, the next thing is the Blue Crown. The mystery diver breaks off from his conversation with this mystery woman. And that's when he notices Key and JJ at the edge of the pier. He starts to approach him, but... It just so happens they jump off the edge of the pier in a dare to one another, and they evade him, unknowingly. But when they get back to shore, Cleo and Pope say, dude, he's up there, we gotta get the hell out of here now, and they flee. They head back to Poglandia, where at this point, John B. and Sarah have returned. They found out exactly what that inscription said. From the half moon to the north star, where the living and dead collide, the gatekeeper will guide the way. Although, the guy who read it, once he finds out it's Blackbeard's, he tells him, get the hell out of here, this thing's haunted. All of them think that that inscription sounds like covert directions. They just don't know what to. Pope then tells the group what the guy said about some blue crown, and that tips off John B. That sounds really familiar. His dad had a book on the blue crown. The blue crown is a legendary item that was created for the Prince of Persia 3,000 years ago. It was said to possess the blessing of the gods themselves, granting whoever wore it invincibility and rare favor. I mean, basically, this thing was a magical crown that granted wishes. And there were some heavy hitters throughout history that wore this thing, like Sir Alexander the Great, Xerxes, Julius Caesar. You get the idea. This thing was lost after Blackbeard apparently found it. So now they have a pretty good idea of what those covert directions might lead to. Before they can find out exactly where these directions lead to, one of their own gets taken. In the middle of the night, Cleo wakes up to go feed some of the bait when she's taken by the mystery diver. The guy ties her up and takes her prisoner and takes him back to his ship, which has a familiar face on it. It's someone Cleo is very familiar with. It's Terrence. In episode 4, when the Pokes wake up the next day, they don't think anything of Cleo's disappearance, and that's because Cleo texted Pope saying that she was looking for bait. Of course, this text didn't actually come from Cleo. It came from the mystery diver who kidnapped her. But this results in the Pogues not really thinking about Cleo too much. Their main concern, at least for most of them, is the surf swell that they're about to hit. They're all taking off for the day to go surfing. Everybody except Pope. He needs to find more about this amulet, what it means, the inscription, all of it. So he's not going surfing that day, which annoys most of them. But then again, he's the responsible one. As for Cleo, she is on that ship, she is tied up, and she is alone, and she's not telling them anything. And while Terrence is on that ship, he didn't really have much to do with this. He was hired by these people to bring them to the Outer Banks. That's about it. He's able to convince the mystery diver, who, by the way, is named Leitner, for a chance to go talk to Cleo and maybe get some information out of her. It's an ulterior motive, though. He wants to get Cleo alone so he can explain to her that these people are dangerous, and if they want to survive, they're going to have to do exactly what they want. This isn't a joke. These people are ex-cons, mercenaries, killers, and they're looking for a trinket, and they're going to get it one way or the other. Later in the day, Leitner, Terrence, and Cleo head back to Poglandia. They know, because of a message from Pope, that the group has gone surfing, so the house is empty. And Cleo assures Leitner that she will get the trinket. She has an idea of where it is. But when she goes in the house and she goes to its last known location, the trinket isn't there. It's just coffee grounds, which pisses off Leitner. He sticks a gun in her face. She doesn't take too kindly to that, so she starts fighting back. 
but Lightner's a lot bigger than her. And it ends up with Lightner on top choking the life out of her. She's only saved when Terrence rushes in and knocks Lightner back. But that just pisses off Lightner even more. Now he sticks his gun in Terrence's face. And Terrence assures him, Cleo will get the trinket. Don't worry, you just have to give her time. And with a gun in both their faces, Cleo says, yeah, no, I'll get it for you, don't worry. The trinket is with Pope, and he took it to his former history teacher to see if he has any ideas about what the inscription means. And the history teacher's best guess is cross-reference Half Moon with places that Blackbeard was, and maybe you'll get the location. Because he thinks that it's a place. It has nothing to do with the actual moon. So Pope decides to do that. He hits the Blackbeard Museum, and sure enough, he gets a hit. Blackbeard visited a place called Half Moon Bay, and that's got to be where the location of Blackbeard's treasure is, and more importantly, the location of the Blue Crown. As he's about to leave the museum, he gets a phone call from Cleo, and she tells him, you need to bring the amulet back right now, because if you don't, they're going to kill me. And that puts the fear of God into Pope. He hops on his dirt bike and he starts frantically heading back to Poglandia, all while calling John B. and saying, you gotta get to Poglandia right now. But John B., Key, Sarah, JJ, they were busy surfing. And while they wanted a nice relaxing day, they didn't get it, because the kooks showed up and they kind of ruined it. Now at first, Topper came over to John B. and said, hey, we're just trying to have a nice day too, let's squash our beef. But it was clear that the beef was not actually squashed. Either way, though, both groups decided we're going to keep separately and we're just going to try to enjoy the day. And it seemed like that's exactly what they were doing until J.J. got involved. There was a big wave that Topper wanted to go after, but J.J. decided, no, I'm going to go after it too. And it was a dick move, and it pissed off the kooks. As both groups were getting ready to leave, Topper's new girlfriend, Ruthie, wanted to show the Pogues who was actually in charge. And Topper wasn't really interested in it, but he got peer pressure to do so. So he hopped in the truck, which Ruthie was driving, and they headed straight for the Pogues. And normally that wouldn't have been an issue, but there was a turtle hatch that all the Pogues were looking at, they were concerned about, they were watching the turtles get to the ocean. And Key tried to wave them down and say, stop the car, there's a turtle hatch, but Ruthie wasn't slowing down. She forced Key to jump out of the way of a moving vehicle. And then she turned the car around and came back after her. Key didn't really care about the dangerous nature of this. She cared about the turtles. And with Ruthie's little stunt, she killed a couple of them. And a very furious Key picked up a turtle carcass, walked it over, and said, look what you did. But there was literally no remorse in Ruthie's face at all. She didn't feel bad about it. Not one bit. You could kind of tell, though, Topper was embarrassed. And hell, even Rafe wasn't really proud of the actions of his friends. But the rest of the kooks, they loved it. And this pissed off JJ so much that he turned around and said, if you guys ever come near us again, I'm going to kill all of you. They then decide to head back to Poglandia unaware of what's actually waiting there for them, which is Terrence, Leitner, and Cleo. But Leitner is getting very, very impatient. Terrence is trying to buy time, saying that this guy will show up, don't worry, just be patient, but Leitner doesn't want to be patient anymore. And finally, he gets to the point where he sticks a gun in Cleo's face because he's about to shoot her. And that's when Pope shows up, just in the nick of time. Pope, though, doesn't want to give over the amulet. And Terrence is kind of sick of Leitner. So they both team up to take Leitner out, but it doesn't work. The amulet gets dropped. Terrence gets shot. Pope gets punched in the face. And at the end of it, Leitner's able to grab the amulet and escape. But Terrence doesn't make it. Cleo and Pope try their best to revive him. They try CPR, but it's just too late. He's lost too much blood. And Cleo is pretty despondent. She had a love-hate relationship with Terrence, but he was like a father figure to her. And now he's dead in Poglandia. When the rest of the Pogues show up, Pope just kind of makes his way outside, but he's covered in blood, and they know that something's wrong. And when they go inside, they see what happened. Pope starts recounting exactly what he walked into, how it happened, but he also tells everybody that he's pretty sure he knows what the inscription means. He's pretty sure that Blackbeard unloaded something at the Half Moon Battery in Charleston. As Pope and John B. are discussing this, they get an unwanted visitor. It's Deputy Shoop. 
There's something about Wes Jenneret's death that has not set well with Shoup at all. For starters, the coroner doesn't think that it was a suicide. He thinks that Wes was murdered. He thinks that he was strangled to death, and that death actually matches up with a guy that they found in the beach, who has no identification on him. The only discernible identification is a trident tattoo on his wrist. So you've got two bodies who died in similar fashions and no suspects. Shoup did bring in Chandler and question him about his whereabouts, but his whereabouts checked out. He showed his Google Maps and his location. The next thing to do was question the other people who saw West Jenner at last, and that was the Pogues. But this impromptu drop-in can't come at a worse time because they have a literal dead body lying in their place. So they kind of start freaking out, not really sure what to do, as Shoop knocks on the door waiting for someone to come out. In episode 5, the Pogues are freaking out a little bit as Shoop just knocks on the door. And what they decide to do is have JJ go out and distract him while everybody else cleans up the body. While outside, J.J. and Shoop go back and forth on why Shoop might be there. All the while, J.J. is just trying to stall so his friends can clean up the body. And they are able to do it just in the nick of time as Shoop and J.J. walk through the front door. Shoop, though, doesn't want to talk to all of them. He only wants to talk to J.J. And that's because the reason why he showed up is the threat that J.J. made on the beach to the kooks. One of them was filming it, and they took it as a death threat. Shoop knows that J.J. actually isn't going to kill these kids. He just had to come talk to him. But there is another reason why he wanted to talk to J.J. He wants to show him the pictures from the corner of the mystery guy to see if maybe J.J. knew who he was. But J.J. actually is legitimately confused on who this guy is. He's never seen him before. Right before Shoop leaves, though, he tells J.J. that the coroner thinks that Wes Jenneret was murdered. And he asks him, what were you doing that night? J.J. is very surprised about this, but he says, we were just here doing a bonfire, hanging out, nothing serious. And with no further questions, Shoop leaves. Now, J.J. is under the impression that Shoop believed his entire story, but Shoop did not, and that's because J.J. was really fidgety. Of course, it had nothing to do with the questions that Shoop was asking. It had everything to do with Terrence's dead body. But when Shoop got back in his vehicle, he radioed for someone to keep a surveillance on the Pogues. Meanwhile, J.J. was informing the group on why Shoop showed up, and more importantly, the fact that Wes Jenneret's death is looking like a murder. They then discuss what exactly they're going to do with the body. They know they need to get rid of it, and the easiest place to do it is dump it in the ocean. And then they have to go on a road trip. Both John B. and Pope tell everybody about what they discovered regarding the Charleston Battery and how they think that that is the location of the Blue Crown. They're planning on heading there the next morning, and Key is really concerned because these people that are also going after the Blue Crown are really dangerous. They killed Terrence. But John B. doesn't feel like they have a choice. So the next morning, after they dump the body, they're heading to Charleston. When they wake up the next morning, they carry Terrence's body to the boat, and they are seen by the surveillance, but to the surveillance, it looks like they're just carrying bags of clams. And as the Pogues make their way out to the ocean, they do notice that they're being followed. They don't really think it's the cops, but they're just on high alert, so they book it, and they end up losing the tail. When they get to a nice location, Cleo says some words, and then they dump Terrence's body. Now, the only person that didn't go on this trip was JJ. He was fixing the Twinkie. And as he was doing so, he got an unexpected visitor. It was Demps, Wes Jenneret's former groundskeeper. He's brought something for JJ. Right before Wes died, he wrote a letter and he told Demps, if anything happens to me, give this to JJ. When JJ reads it, he abandons the Twinkie completely. And that's because this letter essentially said, go ask your dad about Albatross. And JJ hasn't seen his father in a long time. So asking him about this Albatross thing isn't going to be easy. But JJ does have a lead. He heads on over to his dad's buddy's place. And at first, his dad's friend says, yeah, I don't know where he is. I haven't seen him in months. He's a wanted criminal. But JJ just doesn't buy it. So he tells his dad's buddy, yeah, I'm trying to sell something that he has and could be a big fat paycheck and I'm sure he'd kick some down to you. So just let me know if he turns up and that piques the guy's interest. It's a long shot, but JJ heads back home and he waits to hear if his dad will call. While he was gone, Pope, Key, John B., Sarah... Cleo, they all returned, and they're surprised to not find J.J. And he left a note saying he had to run errands, which is very un-J.J.-like, so Key immediately decides to start calling him up, but she's not getting a response. 
With the ferry leaving for Charleston in a little while, they need to get going. So what they decide to do is have Key stay back, run the shop, and the rest of them are going to head to Charleston, try to find the Blue Crown. A couple hours later, with her friends gone and Key running the shop, she gets an interesting visitor. It's Rafe. Rafe seemingly closed the deal with Hollis. He's excited about the opportunity, although he is a little concerned about who her partners are and Hollis isn't giving any information yet until the money clears. But lately, Rafe has also done a lot of soul searching and he wants to reconnect with his sister. With his dad out of the picture, he's starting to realize how important family is. So he came to the shop looking to talk to Sarah, but all he found was a very, very hesitant key who is dripping with attitude. He ends up leaving his card, though, and telling her to have Sarah give him a call. At this point, Key really wants to talk to JJ. But JJ actually got the call that he was waiting for, from his dad. His dad claims that he doesn't really know what he's talking about, but from the background noise, JJ is able to figure out that his dad was at his friend's place the entire time, so JJ heads back there. At first, per usual, with a conversation between JJ and his dad, it starts off contentious, a lot of fighting, but that all changes when the cops show up. Because the cops were still surveilling the Pogues, and that included J.J. So when J.J. took off, and he went to his dad's friend's place, and then they saw his dad is a wanted criminal, they swooped in. J.J. literally led them right to him. His dad, having read Wes's letter, claimed that he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. But when the cops showed up, his tune changed quite a bit. He tells J.J. that if he boats him out of there, he'll tell him everything about Albatross. So J.J. does it, and they head to the lighthouse. It's around this time that the Pogues have arrived in Charleston. They find the battery and they realize they're going to have to head inward and start looking for clues. And it takes all day, but Sarah finds one. She finds a very old church where when you look up, the stained glass is clearly the North Star. And they know they need to go in and start looking around for a crypt where the living and the dead meet. John B. is going to stay outside and keep watch while Pope, Cleo, and Sarah head inside and they start looking around, and they're able to find it. It's the entrance to a crypt. They open up the hatch, Pope and Sarah head down, while Cleo keeps watch inside the church so that they're not caught. The crypt is old, and they don't even quite know what they're looking for, but Pope and Sarah start making their way through it. What they're unaware of is that Leitner and the woman who's in charge have shown up, but they're entering the crypt a different way. Armed with the amulet, the woman finds a crypt, and she uses the amulet like a key to open one of the crypts up. All of this is seen by John B., but he's outmanned and outgunned, so he kind of just watches them enter the crypt. And when they do it, he's really concerned for his friends. He starts running around trying to find any of them, but he can't find anyone, including Cleo. Leitner and the boss and Pope and Sarah meet deep inside the crypt. Pope, however, hears them coming, so he and Sarah are able to hide, while Leitner and his boss end up opening up another crypt to reveal a scroll. They end up taking the scroll, having no idea that Pope or Sarah were in the vicinity, and they exit the same way they came. But as the woman exited the crypt, she relocked it. Pope and Sarah, meanwhile, can't go back the way that they came. That way was also locked, which leaves Pope and Sarah trapped deep inside this crypt with no ability to get out. And to make things way, way worse, the crypt fills up with water. So when it starts raining, they are on borrowed time. Cleo and John B. have no idea about this. And while John B. is looking for any signs of his friends, Cleo casually walks out of the church and she sees the guy who killed Terrence and she wants to extract revenge. She starts to hide behind one of the tombs and she's waiting for her opportunity, but the guy gets to her first. And this guy is a straight killer, and he's ready to kill her. He's got the knife, he's about to stab her, when Cleo is saved by two guys who are just walking by, who start yelling at the guy to get off of her, and start screaming for the cops. Leitner's boss reminds him that they got what they needed, they gotta get out of there. So they do it, they casually walk out of the cemetery. And it's at this point where John B. ends up noticing Cleo on the ground, so he goes to check on her, but she says, those are the people who killed Terrence, go get them. And John B. rushes after them. He hops in the Twinkie, he grabs the gun, and he's got them dead to rights. He could shoot them, but he doesn't, because it's just not in his nature. He lets them get away. And it's about this time, back in the Outer Banks, 
where JJ and his dad have made it to the lighthouse and they've evaded the cops. And now it's time for JJ to find out about Albatross. He tells JJ that Albatross was the name of the boat where Wes Jennerette's daughter died on. The daughter was to have died with her infant son, but she didn't die with her infant son. Her infant son survived. And that's because JJ is the infant son. And Chandler Groff is his biological father. And it also seems like Chandler Groff is one of Hollis's partners. As those two look out of Goat Island and she promises him that it's going to be glorious. And that is the end of Outer Banks Part 1. Thank you so much for getting this part of the recap. I really appreciate it. Consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you like this video. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought this video sucked. I have merch. I have t-shirts. Hey, it's getting cold outside, so grab a hoodie or a mug. Oh, and be nice in the comments section because nasty comments make me feel bad. I'm a person. I have feelings. And make sure to come back for Part 2 in a couple weeks.